start our recording too. We're going to put this on YouTube later. And our club motto is do more and talk less. Here at Fremont Bridge Rotary, we're all bridgers. And what does that mean? Um, it means we reach across cultural, ethnic, religious, social lines to become friends and serve together. Fremont Bridge uh, bridges diverse communities in Silicon Valley and beyond. Facing COVID and unprecedented social unrest stemming from racial tensions within our country. It is up to us to create positive relationships built on trust across racial lines, supporting those in need and using the tools and resources we have, namely the talents of our club members, financial resources and relationships. And the question I want all of our members to ask ourselves this week is, what have you done as a Fremont Bridge Rotarian this week to make the world better, have more peace, and create good relations. So now we'd like to have the Pledge of Allegiance and I'm gonna share the screen and Ruchi is going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Let me get to the screen share and then everybody can mute themselves so it, otherwise it's kind of hard to hear. So um, Ruchi, if you can lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, that would be great, thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, invisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Ruchi. Appreciate that. Um, let's go back here. And next, we're going to have be led by Gita in the four way tests of Rotary the things we think, say, or do. Let me get that pulled up so we can see that. And Gita, if you could lead us in that, that would be great. The four way test of the things we think, say, or do. Is it the truth? Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? All right. Thank you, Gita. Thank you, Kathy. That was a nice, strong there. <laughs> uh, now we have some announcements. So thank you, Ruchi and Gita, for helping out get our meeting started off right. Um, the first thing is our community service. So let's see. I don't think we have Lene on yet. So we'll come back to Lene on what's happening with our August service project that's coming up. So we'll come back to that. The second thing is um, Monica, our international chair, is going to give us an update about an international project that we're involved with in Italy. Um, Monica, could you take it away and update us on that? Hello, how's everybody doing? <laughs> Great. So, um, Today uh, is my first time that I'll be talking about an international project because we have the new uh, session. So it's exciting. Um, so this project, um, it's basically, I'm gonna read off my notes. So if that's okay with you folks, yeah? yeah. So um, the project, it's called to strengthen the Assisi hospital to face COVID-19. And um, we all, it's basically with uh, partnering with Rotary Club of Assisi in Italy, District 2020. And um, Assisi, we all know, is a city in Italy, you know, which is infected with a lot of uh, tourists. And But unfortunately, because of COVID-19, you know, um, things fell apart. So um, the city of Assisi is a community of basically 60,000 people that revolves around the hospital. So the whole idea of this project was to um, have the hospital receive a mobile radiological unit, an external and internal defibrillator, so that they could carry out all the radio, uh, radiographic diagnosis and procedures in the city. So the whole idea was to basically keep um, the patients who had to be screened for COVID or who needed all the equipment uh, and also the medical staff away from the normal people who were not having any issues going on in the hospital. So basically to have two different wards. And since it's, um, it's a mobile unit, so it, I think it was a great thing because it basically um, 
helps to keep things separate and the patients don't have to be moved. And the unit can be just taken to the patients and they can be tested and they can be uh, treated accordingly with the units. Also, the best part was, was is that, you know, they um, want to uh, keep this going even if COVID-19 ceases. So uh, for patients who are like the elderly or patients who have been affected because of COVID, they don't want to move those patients, basically just moving the units to them so that you know, they can be tested and they can be treated. Um, and their entire budget for this is uh, $36,836. And uh, we hope that um, it does what we are intending for it to do. So that's uh, in a nutshell what the project is all about. Yeah, and I think Gita has a little bit more information about this, so if she can just add a few words to it. No, you actually covered most of it. Thank you so much for a very good presentation. That was the gist of it, and you got it. Thank you, Monica. I, I think, yeah, that's about it, yeah. Just a small, just about it, yeah. Well, we're really lucky because we're a brand new club. Thank you, Monica, for sharing with us about this project. It's, it's, it's a big project for a small club. Um, and uh, Nita had started it and uh, Monica's le uh, leading with it. And uh, it's just a great project for us to be involved with. It seems like COVID's coming back and it's very meaningful for us to, to help the people there. And really we're not doing as much because we're a partner club. They need a partner club to participate. So thank you, Monica, for that report. That's really wonderful. And hopefully we can hear more as it progresses and maybe get some photos and maybe we can build some relationships with some international Rotarians. That would be great. Yeah, I think when we get some photos and because we do have to keep track of that, then we can do that as an update maybe in our next meeting and, you know, just share the pictures with everybody then. That would be great. Thank you, Monica. I appreciate it. Um, next, we're going to have Lene. Lene is joined. Uh, we've got Lene. She's going to give us an update on our service coming to fruition. In and so, Lene, you want to give us an update? How are you doing? Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So, guys, I'm sorry. I'm on my phone, so I can't see everyone. I'm helping a friend work in her backyard, uh, which is my weekend projects. And so, there's uh, no way to use my laptop, so I'm having to use my phone here. Um, what our uh, organization that we're going to help this next month is Ruby's Place, which is a battered women's shelter in uh, the Tri-City area. Their um, head office has been moved from Hayward out to Castro Valley, uh, but they service all the women in the area. I spoke with the director and the need for them that has been just overwhelming our groceries. Uh, the moms need food for the kids. They ask for comfort food. And because of the conditions and they're not able to keep staffed at their office in Castro Valley, uh, they have to actually have a volunteer that meets down there to accept food donations. So we came up with a plan and uh, she thought it was brilliant. I think it's going to be the easiest way for us to help them out is gift cards. I asked what grocery store was going to be best for the moms and Safeway was uh, across the board the best gift card. So our project is going to be simple. Everyone has to do a few phone calls. I've already made mine and I've collected three. The rest of it's going to be up to the rest of you. And I'm more than happy to pick up the slack and whatever's not picked up. Uh, I've committed to 50 $100 Safeway gift cards. The super easy thing for all of us to come up with. Once we get all the gift cards, uh, they'll get dropped off at the studio, and then I will take them up and meet with the director at Ruby's Place in Castro Valley and deliver them, and then she will be responsible for handing them out. I know $100 is not a lot to feed a, a single mom and her children, but um, it certainly is a doable um, you know, donation for us as an organization. I figure it's easy to make a few phone calls. I made mine within two minutes and had no problems getting a commitment of three uh, of these $100 gift cards. So I'm hoping that you guys can each join in and uh, be responsible for making a few phone calls to get some people to donate $100 gift cards so that we can meet our goal of 50. Uh, they have worked diligently through this time in putting all of the moms into their individual apartments with their children uh, to get self-sufficiency and job training. A lot of these moms are already working and of course, a lot of them are now not working because of COVID. 
so they are on unemployment. If anyone uh, has any additional input, questions, do not hesitate to reach out to me. Thank you, Lene. I appreciate that update. That sounds great. So a couple of questions for you. We're going to post something on our Facebook inviting other people to participate as well um, that will help our club as a whole. So when money is collected, do people, do they give the money to the club and then the club goes and purchases all these? How is the money going to happen? For the sake of ease, if we could, you know, if somebody wants to go through that extra step, we can. I think that that's an extra step. Uh, given the situation right now, it, the easiest thing might be for uh, the members to come up with the Safeway cards and then just drop them off in the mail slot at the studio. I certainly don't have a problem going down and buying them if they want to give the money to the club and then the club reimburses me. So we can certainly leave it open to either way. Okay, that sounds good. So why don't we do the, why don't we do both? So if some members don't want to go pick up the cards, they can just send money to the club. They can just tell us, me, Gita, or yes. Rekha, that I'm sending a $50 check and we'll just mail that to Gita's house. That's where our bank statements go. Yes. Um, and then we can coordinate that. Or if they wanna just go pick one up and drop it off. And then if you could be on your end, if you could be responsible to make sure when people drop them off, but who's, who's dropping it off and how many? Absolutely. And they will be responsible for recording it all and then we can record it on our website later how much we did and all that kind of stuff is there a target date to get this all done well it's our it is certainly our goal is to do this for the month of august i would like to get this taken care of um, by the second week of august so why don't we say by the second saturday in august i'm afraid to turn my camera on since or my uh, calendar on since i'm on my phone no, you're fine. You don't have to do that. That's fine. That would be the, um, our, our meeting is on the 8th in August, so that would be the 15th. Let's do the 15th. That'll be our deadline to collect these so that I can get them out to Castro Valley. Wonderful. Lene, can you send me a write-up that I can post on our website and our Facebook? Absolutely. I sure will, Paul. All the, so we're recording these meetings so our members can watch these on YouTube, but I will also send an email from your, well, what you send me to all the membership so they know what to do. So, okay. Thank you. Paul, I have a quick question for you. Is there um, a tax benefit if we write a check to the club rather than just, no? Okay, keep saying that. For, just for documenting purposes, but since we're going to report it on the Rotary membership site anyway, they're going to see, oh, they raised such and such a dollar amount. It doesn't actually have to flow through our account. It's for some projects, it's better, especially if it deals with the outside. But since this is an inside project and Lene is running it, I'm comfortable with us just doing it straight. So. Okay. No, her question was if somebody is giving a check, if it is tax deductible. Yes. So, so if you want to get the tax deductibility, you write it to the club. Or you can write it to Ruby's place. Or, yeah, but then they have to go buy the card. So if you write, so if you are concerned about getting that tax deduction, write the check to Fremont Bridge Rotary, mail it, we're going to we'll mail it to Gita's house, she'll be collecting them and Reka will deposit them. That makes it tax deductible. So if you want to, if you want to do it that way, that's for sure tax deductible because it's coming through the 501c3 and then we can buy the cards. If you don't care so much about it, then, you know, just pick them up. So either way is up to the member. We just pay taxes, so that question was top of mind. Yeah, so yes, you definitely want to write a check, Kathy. <laughs> yep, thank you. Thank you, Lene. I appreciate the update. Thanks, you guys. And I hate to be a total loser and bomb out, but I have got to finish working in this backyard because it's just going to get hotter, and I need to finish helping her out getting this work done in her yard. You're doing what a community service person here does. You're <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Almost done. Thanks, you guys. Take care. Uh-huh. Bye-bye. All right. So thank you, Lene, for that. Um, let's see. Paul, I think Mamta just texted me. She's waiting to be there. Thank you. Keep yeah. Because I turn that thing off. Yeah, because I get sidetracked. And so, yes. All right. So moving on, we've got... Mamta's the... waiting still. Mamta has not sent me a request on this meeting. Oh, okay. She's doing the wrong meeting. Uh, <laughs> that's weird she just sent me a text that she's waiting it's not, you know what i'll send her the zoom link carry on the meeting it's okay she did that last time too same problem um social media front okay 
So regarding meetings, Reka brought up a good point. Typically, we're going to have our meetings on the second and fourth Saturday of every month. Usually the second would be the meeting. The fourth would be the service project. This August service project is kind of nebulous. It doesn't have to be on a certain day. The reason this month is a little bit off is because the American Red Cross canceled our service event. And then we found a person to fill in at the last minute. Also, I was trying to be considerate because Kathy was originally planning to have an event the next Saturday for her fundraiser, which I don't know if she's still doing or not, or not, okay. But I was trying to be considerate of another member that was doing a fundraiser and I didn't want those dates to conflict. So going forward, typically, we're gonna have the second and fourth Saturday, but some months may change around. So if you're, work, if you're working on a Saturday and you need to know, say, hey, Paul, I need to know what our meetings are, I will personally let you know when they are as soon as they happen. Um, just let me know that you need to have advance notice. I know Reka needs to have advance notice, and if any of you else are concerned about that, please let me know. So we, we want to be respectful of your time, too. Um, as far as the social coming up, Ruchi, would you like to jump in and give us an update on what's happening there since this is our last meeting before our first social? Yes, I am so excited about it. So it is on July 24th. We're going to do it at 6.30. Uh, so... The simple get your cocktail, wine, it could be even like a glass of water, anything guys, just be ready uh, with some cheese or some kind of an appetizer if you want to, we're just going to have fun. I have sent the uh, details on it, like I want you to, again, we're still trying to get to know each other and I don't know a lot of people still. So we're just going to have like a two minute session just to talk about ourselves and uh, just to tell about ourselves, about our family, about the profession we do and what we like to do. So it should be fun. I'm really looking forward to it, guys. It's going to be our first one, and I hope everybody could make it. So um, it is, and I think uh, Raji has sent us the link already, right? The Zoom link to join in. Uh, she's working on it. She's working on that. Okay. So, so I think I need to update it um, later today, which I will do. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Raji. Yeah. So that's it. So I'm looking forward to it, guys. July 24th at 6:30. And yes, please dress up. That's the main thing. <laughs> so just dress up, look nice. I want, yeah, that, that is something really important. So please dress up and have a nice class in your hand and we're going to have fun. So looking forward to it, guys. How long is it? An hour? Are you planning for an hour? or? Yes, I think so. Yeah, it's about an hour. I mean, we could go a little bit overboard too. It's, it's okay, but yeah. Depends on the gold class you're having. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank, you. Thank you so much. We appreciate that very much. Um, on the social media front, if you have something fun that we can post, please let me know. It doesn't have to be serious. I think some of you, nobody dares like some of the posts. I did a post of our past president, Gita, as a rock star. Um, <laughs> we're not going to take it. But I didn't get any likes. Nobody dared like it. Are you guys scared of Gita? <laughs> I liked it. No, I did. Okay. I, I didn't I saw, see it. I saw I it. Like to be caricatured. <laughs> I saw it. It was really cute. It was funny. I don't know if you recognized your face, and Lene was. I did. I did recognize myself. Trump slam. That was pretty awesome. Yeah. So, Gita, I'm still waiting for you to take revenge. Um, I'm sure it will be painful when it happens. Oh, it's already been planned. <laughs> So if you guys have anything fun that you want to have our posted on our Facebook, please feel free. I think it's a promotion, something exciting happens. We can also post that too. And on our Facebook, I can always select whether it's friends or whether it's public. For example, this video I did friends only. So please feel free to let me know if you want something posted. Wait a minute. You did friends with my mom watched it in Dallas. And she says, what are you looking like that? <laughs> <laughs> So, yep. <laughs> I've watched it like 10 times. I love it. So it's funny. Um, How is she friends with our group? I don't know. Well, she can be a friend. <laughs> yeah. So regarding the website, if you know of a company or an individual that wants to be a sponsor, um, they can be a sponsor for a full year. It's 500 bucks. Um, if you know anybody who wants to get some community attention and we'll announce a little bit in our club meetings, um, that, that is an option. On the membership front, our chair, Gita Kadambi, wants us to each member to make an introduction of a visitor or potential new member sometime during the month of August and September. Yes, she will be keeping track, and you know she will. 
Uh, formal introductions for newer members and the pinning ceremony will take place for those who didn't get to do the official new member ceremony on August 8th. And uh, if, if you're a new member that didn't get to do the, your official pinning ceremony, which is a lot of members, reach out to Gita. She's going to have you do something to prepare for it. And then we're going to do an official, that's going to take up a lot of our announcement time during the next meeting. And it's a very important part of when you join Rotary. We want to acknowledge you. So thank you for Gita for getting that ready. And we look forward to doing that. Um, as you can also see, I'm wearing a tie again today. Wow. Um, I encourage our members to dress in business, uh, business casual attire for our meetings. It's up to you, but our meetings are automatically recorded and I am posting them to YouTube so that members that miss the meeting can uh, catch up on what happened during the meeting. And also, so if we have some potential members, they wanna see what are these crazy people doing at Rotary, then they can watch one of our meetings and see what we're all up to. Um, with that said, we've got about six minutes left. I need a couple of minutes to introduce our speaker. Does, do any members have any questions, concerns, or something they would like to bring up? Rika, how do you want me to, um, to do the deposits? I've got a whole bunch of checks sitting here at home. Sorry, I was on a mute. Uh, <laughs> so probably um, I can pick it up from you. Is that what you want me to do? I can do is, that. Is your Fremont uh, um, um, bank open? open? I can. I can, okay. I'll go deposit on Monday. You don't need to come all this way. Okay. okay. You have to make an appointment with the Comerica branch. They um, they make you make an appointment. It's not super strict, but you just gotta call them, and I'll send you the guy's name. So. Okay. So I'll do a little, quick little announcement, and we're probably going to add some point to our club this thing called Happy Cup, which is like if you want to make an announcement and it's like, you know, you wanted to donate like 20 bucks, you can make an announcement about something good that happened. Um, but I'm going to donate 20 bucks to the club, and I want to share something about one of our members. Uh, our member, the member is Reka. So she personally was watching out for me uh, during this whole COVID crisis. She's a business banker, and she contacted me and she was like, hey, have you taken advantage of the PPP thing? Have you taken advantage of the EID thing? All these acronyms from the SBA. And she really did watch out for me as a business owner. And that is the definition of vocational service. When we serve each other as members, um, when we serve each other as members in our profession to help better our you know, other members' lives or what's going on with them, that is the definition of vocational service. So I wanna send a shout out to Reka. Thank you for that. And she's very good at what she does. And I'm gonna make a $20 donation um, to the club because of what she's done to help me. So, and with that, I'm gonna share- uh, Thank you, Paul. You are most welcome. Reka, she does care about her people. I know that. My pleasure. So I'm going to do a quick little introduction here for our speaker, Jim, and then he's going to get control of the screen. So I'll show you the bio while I read it. There's a picture of Jim looking sharp. Uh, Jim, the, your last name is pronounced Carrier? Perfect, Carrier, yes. Wonderful. Jim Carrier joined Rotary International in 2004. He's the past president of the San Rafael Harbor Rotary Club. Maybe he's a sailor. He has served in Rotary District 5150 as the shelter box chair, area membership chair, assistant district, assistant governor, district administrator, and on the grant stewardship committee. Clearly he's involved in Rotary. Jim is a major donor to the Rotary Foundation and a 15 year member of the Paul Harris Society. Jim learned of the shelter box program in 2007 and the Rotary International Convention in Salt Lake City. He immediately agreed to become an ambassador and has done presentations to Rotary clubs and other groups throughout the Western United States. Jim was elected to the Shelter Box Board of Directors in 2020, serving as the organization's chairman in 2017 and 18. Wow. Through his board service, though his board service has come to an end, Jim continues to serve on the SBUSA Finance and Audit Committee. Originally raised in New Orleans, Louisiana, Jim is a graduate of Louisiana State University. Professionally, he is a senior vice president with First Federal Savings of San Rafael, overseeing operations, IT, business continuity, compliance, retailing, banking. Jim and his wife, live in, uh, Nancy, live in Oakland since 85. Their son, Joseph, is a recent graduate of William Nett University in Salem, Oregon, and he begins veterinary school, wow, in UC Davis, at UC Davis in August. And with that, 
I would like to welcome Jim. Let me turn the controls over to you, Jim. And thank you for being our speaker today. Appreciate it. Okay. You are the host. All right. Jim, if you see any members trying to join, watch out for that because we have a click where we click them in just when you're on your right. Not a problem. We need to move that bar. There we go. Much better. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Should see a green box. Okay. Let's get started. Um, Interesting. You actually got my right name, my, my last name correct, but you got Willamette wrong. It's Willamette University. I always thought it was Willamette too, but it's in the Willamette Valley up in Oregon where my son went to school. Um, we've got a whole lot to, uh, to cover, and uh, I'm going to go pretty fast, but I promise we will end on time. That said, my afternoon is free, so I'll stick around for as long as you guys want to. But we're going to talk about Shelf Docs now. It's, we're an international disaster relief charity that is a project partner of Rotary International. Um, Shelterbox basically is here because of issues in the, uh, the world. Uh, these numbers kind of jump out, 88 million people that's growing every day that are currently displaced by natural disaster and conflict. Conflict's a big problem right now. When I got involved with this organization, the vast majority of what we did was responding to national, natural disasters, earthquake, uh, flooding, tsunami, uh, you name it. But now 60 to 65% of what we do is conflict, man-made. And the number really jumps out at me, 25 people every minute. So this meeting started 30 minutes ago. Since the minute this meeting started, another 750 people have lost their home, and that'll be 1,500 before we're done. Our aid's pretty simple. Uh, we have our basic box, our relief tents, and these shelter kits. We're gonna talk more about shelter kits later. Uh, we have four different tents we actually use. The standard relief tent that anyone has seen at pets or other rotary events. The OACE, which is a, um, an improvement on that in areas where you can see it's got the full front porch. The Flex 3 is an absolute beast. That tent is uh, fully insulated. It is designed so that I can put a wood burning cook stove inside for warmth. And then the UN spec tent. We use the UN spec tent, particularly in conflict zones, where it would be obvious that uh, if the aid came from the West, that it would be dangerous for some people to use. So we use the uh, United Nations spec tents. The basic box, whoops, the basic box has the tent, blankets, uh, water purification, mosquito nets if necessary, uh, cookware, uh, a wood burning stove, a child's activity pack, and everything we do, we pack disaster specific. So depending upon where we're going, we may take some of this out and add in other items. It just depends upon where the disaster strikes. Solar lights through a company called Luminade. Um, if any of you watch the show Shark Tank, uh, the two ladies that run Luminade uh, got their start there. Their funding is through Mark Cuban, and they've become a partner of Shelter Boxes. And every time we deploy, these solar lights go out. Shelter Kit is a really neat thing. Um, and then the nice part there, especially in, in an urban environment, is we'll take basic supplies with locally sourced wood, and it may not look like much to start with, but in developing nations, they're pretty resourceful, and they can turn that into a home. And that is actually a much stronger structure than even my standard relief tent. And that relief tent is designed to withstand 80 mile an hour winds and rains. It's designed to withstand up to a category one hurricane, my relief tent. But these structures are even uh, stronger. And we deliver these by any means necessary. Uh, it would be great if you could land a 747 or a large plane next to every disaster zone, but it doesn't work that way. So often we'll get as close as we possibly can. We do keep our aid pre-deployed around the globe, but uh, we'll strap them onto donkeys to take them up in the mountains, in this case, in Pakistan. Um, this was in Nepal many, many years ago. These boxes go out between 100 and 135 pounds, and we carried 500 up them, up this uh, structure to get them where they needed to go. And uh, we deliver by any means necessary, and that's no bull. Now, now, technically, it's a water buffalo, but it's a stupid bad joke. You just have to work with me on this sometime. Uh, this is much more common, though. Um, and this is another way Rotary comes into this is often on the ground, 
we will find local Rotarians if we're in a country where Rotary exists, and, and, and they do exist in most. And they will get us through red tape. They will help us source transportation, um, airplanes, helicopters, so we can do surveys. Assessments before we deliver it is very, very important. So this is much more common. And the box has its uses too. Um, I mentioned earlier that sometimes I change uh, slides in my presentation. This is one I've never taken out since the first presentation I did in late 2007. Uh, this family was living in our tent in Africa and they actually gave birth and they took one of our blankets, put it inside the box itself and it became the crib for that baby. Uh, and I've seen similar pictures repeated over and over and over over the years. So now how we do it. This is what I think is so important to shelter box. And it started with the Boxing Day tsunami um, in 2010, 2000, excuse me, excuse me, 2004. That is really when we went from delivering a few boxes here, a few boxes there, 150, 200, to massive deployment. So we started our response teams. And so now when we go out in the field, we don't deliver our aid unless either our response team members go with it or our response team members turn it over to a trusted international partner. And these folks go through an amazing amount of training. If someone wants to be on our response team, you would apply, it's about a one year process. You're going to go through testing. You're gonna go through uh, probably Skype interviews then in-person interviews. If you get through all of that, you end up at a four day assessment. Um, and that is where we really will do everything we possibly can to push you physically and mentally and see if we can find your breaking point. Because if we can find a breaking point, you're out of the program. And that may sound harsh, but you have to understand, if you're chosen to be on the team, you're going to be responsible for millions of dollars of aid in the field. And it's not like you can land and pull out your sat phone and your binder and say, okay, earthquake in Ecuador, this is what I do. No, no, you have to be able to function on the ground. And we can talk much more about the response team later. Uh, these two gentlemen are good friends of mine. Uh, David Ebbe on the left from Nashville, Tennessee, and Wayne Robinson on the right from, uh, from Georgia. David's phone rang literally six minutes after the earthquake struck in Haiti in 2010. And our founder at the time says, just get there. He goes, I don't know what we're going to do, but we know we're going to do something and we know it's going to be big. And to this day, Haiti is still our biggest uh, deployment ever. We'll talk about that more later. But this is 48 hours after these boxes were flown in on French Red Cross planes and uh, weren't actually used for housing at that point. We did massive housing later. But our first boxes in Haiti were set up and used for medical facilities. Um, first for basically, you know, medical evals and things like that, but eventually we're, we're literally used for operating rooms. It was the most sterile environment that could be found. Uh, pretty horrific situation there, at least in the early months. We're incredibly focused. In, in 20 years, we have not gotten into mission creep. All we do still is shelter. The way we do it is dramatically different than even when I joined the organization. But we have not wavered from that, providing shelter to those most vulnerable. And one of the ways we've gotten so much better is that now, and, and for the last seven or eight years, after every deployment, we'll send out, we call them a meal team. And there's monitoring, evaluation, accountability, and learning. And they go out and they talk to every, not every, but almost every recipient family. What worked? What didn't work? What gear could be better? They come back, they're debriefed, and that goes into our R&D, which allows us to improve our tent. We're on about the 10th version of the tent since I joined the organization 13 years ago. And again, we're constantly evaluating. One of the reasons we do those shelter kits now is because of things we learned um, in the Philippines after Typhoon Haiyan. And that's why we now will build shelters. We can help more people with that. This is a picture of Ned Morris, uh, a friend, a response team member from Walla Walla, Washington. He is actually in Ecuador. Uh, last year on a, on a monitoring and evaluation assessment. That's actually a shelter kit that over time, they reinforced, they were able to source some plywood. So they put plywood on the inside. In the back, you can see the tarpaulin that came with it originally, but they've just constantly taken that shelter kit and made it a stronger structure to live in. And our partnership with Rotary. Um, interesting, when Shelterbox first started, we went to Rotary and said, do you want to take on this project? We were told no. Rotary is not a first responder. You just do it at the club level. About four years later, Rotary came to us and said, wow, this is pretty successful. Would you make the box blue? And we said, no, we would not. They said, well, will you call it Rotavox? We said, no, we will not. And by that point, we had 14 international affiliates. So the two of us just stared at each other. Well, under the term of uh, Rotary International President Kalyan Banerjee from India, uh, we signed the first partnership agreement. And since then, every two years, we have done that. And the partnership between Rotary and Shelterbox has never been stronger now. We are their go-to uh, organization for disaster 
and we make sure that that rotary logo is on every shelter box item that's out there. We mention them in inter interviews. We, the, the, partner, the partnership lifts both boats. So I want to talk uh, at least briefly on the major disasters we've gone to. I'd already mentioned the Boxing Day tsunami. Uh, again, up to that point, the most we'd ever, most boxes we'd ever deployed was about 350. We ended up putting 10,000 boxes into uh, this area. The epicenter of this was Banda Eche, Indonesia. I actually met people at the Rotary International Convention in New Orleans uh, when they did the first Rotary Disaster Preparedness Conference who had lived in our tents and they called it Rotary City. No one knew who Shelterbox was still, but all those tents had the Rotary logo, so they called it Rotary City. Uh, just an example, this is a military transport plane uh, that there were 664 shelter boxes on that and eventually 10,000 boxes went in there. Uh, Haiti, for, for lack of a better way to describe it, was the Super Bowl of disasters. Um, you had intense heat, rain, winds, and a massive, massive earthquake there. Not a very strong earthquake, but it caused a massive amount of damage. It not only destroyed structures above ground, but it destroyed the infrastructure, the electricity, the water. Um, and so you had a huge problem with airborne and waterborne illness inside Port-au-Prince. Um, and, and to imagine what this looked like for us, you just imagine flying into San Francisco and you look to the left and Foster City is not there any longer, it's flat or flying into Oakland and Fremont and Hayward are gone for miles. That's what you see. We had to get people out of the city center though. So we pushed them out into uh, the suburbs and we found out that if you do it properly, we could get almost 275 shelter box tents on a soccer pitch. And so this is how we ended up eventually sending in 27,000 boxes and an additional 8,000 tents. Almost a half of the people in, in, in uh, in Haiti that were housed after this disaster were held, housed in shelter box tents. Three dollars went, and yet at that point, no one knew who we were. Japan was interesting in that, um, well, first, I'm from Louisiana, as mentioned earlier, so earthquakes aren't really my thing. But I was out here for Loma Prieta. It shook for 17 seconds, scared the hell out of me. The earthquake in San Francisco at the start of the 19th century, uh, 20th century, excuse me, uh, shook for 45 seconds. This earthquake shook for over three minutes. It would flatten anything around here. We can't fathom an earthquake of that strength, and yet there was very little damage structurally in Japan because the buildings are designed to withstand that. But a three-story wall of water pushed in, and that's what caused almost all the damage. From this, and, and, and the Japanese are very, very prepared for disasters. They had shelters set up literally within days, but some people would not go into the shelters because they were either um, sick or ill and out of respect for their fellow citizens they wouldn't go into a shelter or they had pets and pets weren't allowed in the shelters so we both helped them but we also took our tents inside those shelters and started a program we call shelter in a shelter and i'm going to talk a lot about that more for u.s disasters later typhoon Haiyan. Uh, at the time it was the strongest storm ever recorded uh, it's now the third strongest but what we learned from this, and, and once again, you know, we, we go to where the, the typhoon struck, but we push farther and farther in. And we eventually found a community on the Bintanyan Islands where no one else was helping, and yet the destruction was massive. So almost, almost all of our aid went into the Bintanyan Islands. But also what happened there is there's a very large Filipino population on the West Coast here, actually throughout the, the United States, and Shelterbox USA and Shelterbox raised more money than could actually be spent in the disaster. And even though we always say, if we take in more that can be used for this specific disaster, it'll be used for the next one. We knew people wanted to help the Philippines. So we partnered with Active Catholic Relief uh, Services, Handicap International and Islamic Relief, and we built these transitional structures. And this is another area where you've got shelter box, sort of the point of the spear that we're the first responders. We get in there immediately. Then you start building this transitional shelter that can take someone out to the three year, four year, five year, and then suddenly you've got Rotary who is very, very good at the long-term rebuilding. And once again, you see how two organizations are so much stronger together than they ever could have been apart. And literally it's from this uh, deployment here and these transitional shelters that we started thinking about how to do the shelter kits. And that's why we do the shelter kits now because a, a standard box is approximately $1,000, whereas a shelter kit is about 125, 150. So I can help literally eight times as many people with shelter kits as I can with a standard box. 
Now, this deployment was not a large deployment, but I, it kind of gives you an idea of how our response team members have to think on their feet. Um, uh, uh, Fiji, obviously Pacific Islands, and uh, Cyclone Winston, when it came through, it destroyed everything above ground and almost all of their water storage was in uh, above ground water storage containers and they were all knocked down. So there was a severe shortage of fresh water on, the, uh, on, on, on Fiji. We were working uh, with an Australian division of the Royal Yachting Association that was helping us, you know, sail around the islands. And um, interestingly enough, most of these were luxury yachts designed to go to sea. It was one of the most comfortable deployments our response team members have ever been on. But on an ocean going yacht, you have a desalinization plant. You know, so basically we're rushing these boxes on the island, setting up the tent, setting up the gear, taking the boxes right back out using the desal plant to fill them up with fresh water and bringing fresh water onto the island. It was just a solution that worked in that given situation. Lake Chad Basin is a very, very scary situation. Been going on for about 18 months now. Uh, not a lot of people are even talking about this, and yet there's 850,000 people uh, that, are, that are homeless right now in the area. To give you an idea where I'm talking about, I, I'm not sure who drew up the lines in Africa, but they're kind of weird. But you've got Nigeria, Cameroon, Chad, and Niger, four countries that all touch in this area right here where Lake Chad is. And it is their, their primary source of water. Both Niger and Chad in this area are very arid. And right now the area is experiencing extreme drought. And when you zero down a lot, you've got what used to be a massive lake that supplied water has now shrunk, and even the delta around it has shrunk. So you've not only got the water shortage causing famine uh, and drought, but you've got massive amounts of conflict over this lake right now. So you've got a combination of a natural and man-made disaster that's causing this. Now this is a good example of where using these UN spec tents comes in handy, because over in the western part of Africa, you have Al-Shabaab, and uh, in the eastern part, you've got Boko Haram, who are uh, offshoots of, of Islamic State, and Al Qaeda, and uh, you know it would be very, very dangerous to have aid, obviously, from the West. So this is an example where the uh, UN spec tents come in. I, I think we'll be responding here for the next two, three, four years, probably, and this could eventually get as bad as the Syrian situation, which we're going to talk about in a bit. Uh, here in the United States, we do deploy here. We deployed for Hurricane Katrina. We've gone out uh, after. Uh, about 10 years ago, we had a, well, not 10 years ago, seven years ago, for whatever reason, weather changes, we had these tornado cluster storms that struck throughout the South, and we would send people to help there. But this is a situation, this is the George R. Brown Center in Houston, Texas. It was designed to house about 5,000 people, about 12,500 people ended up inside there. Horrific conditions, you know, people are under lights 24-7, very cramped, but unfortunately, it's, it's somewhat necessary. We learned from Hurricane Katrina and the uh, Montreal Convention Center down there, that for security and to be able to feed people, these mass evac centers are important. So once again, this is where that shelter in the shelter situation came in handy. And we brought in tents that we can't even use in the field anymore because they're not, they're not you know, they're, they're worn out. Uh, and these are much smaller than we normally use, these mini tents, but we put them inside the center. We've actually been written up in Psychology Today magazine because what we do with these is everyone checking in to uh, an evac center goes through a medical eval. So it provides some privacy for that. We have lactation stations for breastfeeding mothers. We have people that hold church services in these tents. AA meetings are held in these tents. Over here, we set up an area just for kids to play or a nursery area. Sometimes families who are stuck in this bad situation just need 15 to 30 minutes alone. We can provide that in a little bit of privacy. So it's called shelter in a shelter. Uh, obviously the same, uh, later on, uh, we had Irma and Maria. First Irma went into Florida after tearing through the, the Caribbean and then Maria came through. And these were horrific storms. To give you an idea of how strong mother nature is, that's approximately a 75 foot, uh, 75 yard long ship. And it was thrown a quarter mile in just to give you an idea how strong these storms can be. Uh, again, shelter box tent set up uh, on, this is on Barbuda. And I love this picture. The home was destroyed. What you're looking at is the foundation of the home. But the person using this tent was actually a photographer. He's got the luminate lights inside. That's providing the light and the stars behind. So actually a beautiful picture from a fairly horrific situation. Uh, Syria. 
uh, growing up, I always thought Rwanda would be the biggest uh, humanitarian crisis in my lifetime, and, and Syria has far surpassed that. And we're hoping the Lake Chad Basin doesn't go in the same direction. Uh, conflict there since uh, 2011. I uh, don't know if any of you have ever traveled to Syria, but it was a fairly prosperous nation. You would be hard pressed right now to go anywhere in that country and not see evidence of, of the fighting that's gone on, damaged buildings, uh, areas like that. And the worst part of this is that the people that are affected the most here are kids. Uh, over 50% of the folks that are, have lost their home are children. And whether you're a fan of, of Bashar al-Assad or not, and, and I'm not, but you know, the vast majority of, of children in Syria went through all the way through what we would consider high school, and quite a few of them went on through what we would uh, uh, you know, consider the equivalent of college. And right now, half of those kids have not been in class for the last seven, eight, nine years. So people say, well, it's, it, it, it's happening over there. It's not our problem. Well, no, we, 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 we're, we're getting a lost generation from an educational standpoint. That is our problem, not just today. That's our problem in 10 years. That's our problem in 20, 25 years. So, and, and this is just telling them what would happen if all the fighting stopped this afternoon, and that's not going to happen. So massive problems there. Um, we are obviously responding. One of the things we're doing is not just sending boxes and shelter kits in. But these blue boxes are things, and we do this a lot, not just in Syria. We call those uh, school boxes. And inside those are basic educational materials. So to the extent possible, classes can start again. Now, it's not like being in class. I mean, they're generic materials. They have to be made to be used in any language. Uh, but, but again, uh, we are trying to make a difference in that area there. Uh, we actually supplied an area. I've, I've got, I could do a 30-minute presentation. It was called School in a Cave. And it was an area where a cave had been uh, found. And the kids were safe there, even if they, they felt it was structurally sound enough that even if the area were bombed, the children would be safe. And that's where they were holding classes. Um, these uh, kids packs uh, we're putting in, and again, you'll see here those UN spec tents in the back. These come from uh, United Nations High Council for Refugee, uh, but gives you an idea how those are used. Where we are currently, uh, normally Shelterbox responds in a typical year. This is a very non-typical year. Uh, to approximately 20 to 24 disasters uh, a year, a couple, couple every month. Uh, you know, we've talked about Lake Chad, Burkina Faso, you're actually having fighting from this area that's pushing into this area. Uh, in India, uh, Bangladesh and, and these areas here, Rohingya refugees, uh, really huge problem with COVID. We're in the Philippines so much that we have actually set up the shelter box division in the Philippines. We have always kept gear prepositioned on the Philippines. Because from there, it's gonna be earthquakes, it's gonna be you know, typhoons, uh, average three deployments a year, sometimes as many as five or six, and then Vanuatu, a small little island uh, off of Australia. Cyclone Harold went through uh, Vanuatu. This is not a major, a major deployment, but it's our third time going into Vanuatu. But right now in COVID, they've had almost no cases on this isolated island, and smartly, they wanna keep it that way. So they're, they're allowing aid in, but they're not allowing people in. So we're having to send aid from Australia, but we had to find trusted partners on the island we could work with. And we literally had to instruct them on how to set up the tents and how to use our gear on the equivalent of a Zoom meeting, okay? So we're still deploying. We're just much slower than we're used to being. Uh, India and Bangladesh, uh, again, the cyclone that came through there, uh, and, and this is not just the, the, the problem of the refugee camps, but it's, it's in, in, in the COVID world right now. To, to give you an idea uh, of, of the problems you have if, if COVID gets into some of these camps, and, and there, there are cases of COVID in Syria. We've been fairly lucky uh, in Bangladesh right now. But Fremont, for instance, okay? The density in Fremont is 3,100 people per square mile, all right? In Wuhan, China, where the coronavirus started, it's 9,600 people per square mile. In Bangladesh, in these refugee camps, it's 64,600 people per square mile, you know? So I guess I could do a presentation called, first, how do you shelter, uh, you know, how do you socially distance in a conflict zone, or how do you shelter in place when you don't have shelter or a place? That's one of the biggest issues that, that's terrifying us right now in, in the age of COVID. Um, John Huco, Secretary uh, General for uh, Rotary, actually had uh, the CEO of Shelterbox on his weekly radio program uh, about three weeks ago, and he talks about the importance of, uh, of what we're doing out there right now. I mean, we've changed our deployment 
to where we're now handing out masks. All of our response team members, when they can go, are in full PPE. You know, it's getting better for our British-based response team members. They can go to some areas, though there are serious travel restrictions. Almost half of our response team members, though, are from the United States. And if you hold a United States passport, it's about the most worthless travel document in the world right now. All right. You can't go with the U.S. passport where we need to be. So we've literally, in addition to having to slow down our deployments, we've grounded about 43 percent of our workforce, our volunteer workforce for shelter boxes grounded. So that's why things have slowed down for us. Um, but in everything we put out now, uh, wash basins, soap, uh, we make sure people have the ability to wash their hands. The instructions throughout the, the world are no different than they are here. Wash your hands, wear a mask. The big difference is they pay a lot better attention in other parts of the world than they do here. Uh, again, hand washing stations, and literally in Somaliland, you'll notice we're practicing social distancing and delivering aid. I mean, we're making people sit 10 feet apart. It's important and it's working. So uh, you get to the point, how can Fremont Bridge help? Um, you know, nothing happens at Shelterbox without donations. Uh, we do for major disasters, except donation, disaster specific donations because that's just the human nature way. You know, something happens, people wanna help, they pull out their checkbook. But that really doesn't work in the shelter box world. If it's gonna be a major deployment, we're gonna be there for six months, nine months, a year, yeah, we'll sometimes do disaster specific. But the reason I can deploy today is because someone donated money to me six months ago, okay? Because this wheel, it starts at number one, it's the donation that powers everything we do. Because then when the disaster strikes, we can assess and see if our aid is needed, and we do very, very detailed assessments. If we have enough time at the end, I can explain our decision to deploy criteria. We pack the aid, we deliver, we pull communities together. We've done many, many studies that talk about if we, you know, we'll go into an area, but we'll go back a year later and assess. Well, if we had not gone in here and this village had not re responded or, or come back, this village was gone, what would the effect be on the overall area, on that community, on that part of the country? You know, this is important stuff. Uh, for that held us, you become what we call a shelter box hero. There are several levels of hero. Uh, I know you don't need another certificate you're not gonna look for, but shelter box heroes do get badges for their website, Facebook page, stuff like that. We always need volunteers. Um, I began my shelter box journey as a volunteer. Uh, that volunteer service got pretty intense when I served on the board. Uh, made several trips to uh, to the UK where Shelterbox is uh, based. Um, but if I get nothing else out of this meeting, I would really love for one of your club members to become a club champion. Now that sounds like it's a big responsibility, it is not. You go to our website and you sign up, and that means you agree to get an email from us once a month, and we'll tell you what Shelterbox is doing. And we ask it at your club meeting, and every club's a little bit different, whether you call them happy dollars or bitch bucks or you know uh, good times. You know, pay your dollar fine and tell the club about what's going on in the shelter box world. So if nothing else, I'd love to get a club champion. Uh, people that do what I do will give you a tricked out shelter box shirt uh, and you go out and you do presentations. I love to talk in front of Rotary Clubs, but unfortunately, this is what I've got now uh, is doing presentations like this. Um, you know, and everything in between, response team members, it's all volunteer, okay? A couple of things I don't want you to do in a disaster. You'll see when the and it's going to happen when the first Florida hits, uh, first hurricane hits Florida. You're going to see some idiot anchor from CNN standing out there talking about how heavy the wind is. Don't do that. All right. This is a deck board that was ripped off a deck and went right through a palm tree. All right. Trust me, a coconut flying at 90 miles an hour will kill you. Okay. <laughs> Don't go out. And again, in a disaster, people want to help. And they donate whatever, and, and, and it, but unfortunately, in a disaster, cash is king. And this is not the George R. Brown Center. This is not Hurricane Katrina. This is the Marin Civic Center three years ago when the fire struck. But people didn't know what to do, so they donated. This will never, ever be used. I mean, I could go on for hours on warehouses of things in Haiti that rotted because people with good hearts sent it, but they had no distribution plan. Shelterbox has a distribution plan. So with that, I am going to jump out of this, turn things back over to Paul, and take any questions that you folks may have. Thank you, Jim. 
I think that's great. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Jim? That's a lot of information. Go ahead. Well, I just lost the car. Well, uh, I, I'll give you the, we don't let people sponsor individual boxes anymore. When we did, it was $1,000. Um, the gear in there, though, is going to be anywhere from 375 to 550 But then you've got shipping. You've got the cost of those response teams, airfare. But when people ask me, what does the box cost? Well, the box I'm sending to New Zealand or the box I'm sending to Ecuador or the box I'm sending to Haiti. After the Haiti earthquake, Sir Richard Branson uh, gave us use of three of his aircraft, and uh, we flew boxes into Haiti for two weeks for free. Uh, shortly after that, though, Haiti was the most expensive shipping destination in the world. Human nature takes over. So it varies greatly, but we say a box sponsorship is uh, $1,000. What we hey. don't do is track that box for you any longer. Hey, Jim, this is uh, Millie, and I'm absolutely blown away by the good work. I couldn't have imagined that I would be actually listening to so much of global impact that you guys are making. How are you guys partnering with tech companies, if at all you are? And if not, what has been the attempt to partner with tech companies? There's a whole portion of donations that tech companies keep aside for profit, nonprofits like this, and it's huge impact. We'd love well, to hear what you guys have done. A couple things. When you say partner to me, I'm saying how are tech companies help us with deployments? Uh, I, don't, right. I don't think financial support, but... Uh, uh, Donations. I'm, Paul is going to have my email, and I can get you in touch with the uh, Shelterbox USA president. Our offices are in Santa Barbara, California, and we can work through that. But we do partner with tech companies. Um, I, I'm not a response team member. I started the training, and I was quickly thrown out. Um, uh, I was one of those people they found my breaking point pretty early on. Um, you know, I'm a bit of a type A personality, and, and uh, we were failing at so many of these challenges, and I was getting angrier and angrier and angrier. And before I realized that my team wasn't failing, I was failing my team. Shelterbox quickly realized, no, nope, you're a good guy, but you're not response team material, so you're out. Um, but back in those days, I don't know how, why, but you'd always get the phone call at three o'clock in the morning. It's like, you know, honey, can I go to Bolivia? Uh, now it's all done on an app, okay? And people set up themselves when they're available for deployment. The deployment notices go out, you get a briefing, you go online, you do your own research. I mean, you're constantly having to keep yourself up to date for shots for going any place in the world. You know, there's a lot to being a response team member, but literally within 48 hours, you're on an airplane. So we use that. Uh, we have some fundraising folks that have used a couple tech companies to create holographic images of our things. So you can actually sit in a room and create a holographic image of the tent. But would, would love to talk to you after this presentation is over and see ways we might be able to work together. Um, we have some very large corporate donors in the United States that we work with, foundations and things like that. A lot of them are funding initiatives like Lake Chad because you're not going to get the average person that's going to want to give money to Lake Chad or to Syria, unfortunately. It's, it's, that's, that's over there. But those are fundable initiatives we find large corporations and foundations want to work with us on. Next question? Yeah. No, happy to talk, and uh, um, I, I'm just trying to think about how you can get more exposure to if there are any ways to get you to be um, more exposed in terms of the work that you guys are doing, so we can talk more. We Thank can, you. and I'm, I can do presentations anywhere. I actually did a presentation uh, at Yahoo uh, bum, 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 about six, seven years ago. Uh, no, it had to have been longer ago than that. Uh, but uh, I've done presentations down and I'm, I'm not that far away. So hopefully one day I've, I've presented at the Microsoft campus, I've presented on the Google campus. Um, you know, hopefully one day I'll be able to present in person again. Paul, I know I've reached the one o'clock uh, uh, cutoff time and, and I wanna be respectful of your members' time. I, I wanna leave you with one thing and then I will stay on this as long as you guys want. I don't have to do anything until about 6.30 when I'm cooking dinner tonight, so I've got all afternoon. But I want to share with you uh, the worlds of, of, of Paul Wolfson when he spoke to the World Bank. And he, and he said, if, if, if we act now with effort and foresight, if, if, we, if we work responsibly, if we think globally and allocate our resources accordingly, we can give our children a more peaceful and equitable world, a world where suffering is greatly reduced and everyone can have a sense of hope. 
what I think is important is that you realize that's not a dream. It's a responsibility. It's why I do what I do. It's why you're Rotarians. I thank you so much and God bless. And I will stay for questions as long as you would like. Paul, thank you. Gita, thank you. You guys are awesome. Thank you, Jim. We appreciate the presentation. So with that, there's really nothing else as far as club goes. So I'm going to leave the, the meeting open. So anybody wants to continue asking questions, just go ahead and ask Jim now. And I will share a bunch of information with Paul that he can pass on to the club uh, after the fact too, okay? I'd like to do a Facebook post and I wanna do a, 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 our, our website blog, but I'd like to do an email to members if there's something like, for example, Millie's asking where they can reach you and you know, something where they can, there's an action item in there that they can follow up on too. So You'll have that within 15 minutes after we log off, I promise. Okay, Jim, I have a question. Uh, my name is Kathy Laidlaw and I work with teens here locally in the Bay Area, specifically at risk teens. And I'm wondering if there are any types of volunteer projects, programs that I can get some at risk teens together for when we can actually get people together. I don't know. You say you're local in Oakland. So just is there anything that you see feasible to get teens together on so that they can help others around the world? Well, there's a couple of ways we can go about that. Uh, I think some of our most amazing fundraisers are uh, teenagers. Um, your district, in fact, has the largest uh, interact uh, district in the world. And they made Shelterbox a, uh, uh, their, their, their partner, uh, I, I, I don't remember how many years ago. I remember I was at the kickoff. It was at a high school down in Milpitas. And it was, the gym was packed. It was amazing. And they ended up raising close to $100,000. Oh um, we could certainly come up with a program. We have a program we call the Shelter Box Challenge, which I have run at Rila camps. Uh, I know you have Rila in your district. We have Rila in our district, where you break folks into teams. And we run them through four or five different challenge stations. One of them is a customs challenge station, where they you know, have to get through the evil customs agent. And it's all team building exercises. It's, it's not a fundraising, it's not doing anything for disaster relief, but you know, again, uh, more than happy to talk with you about that in ways I can help. I mean, I, I'm all about youth and helping our kids today. I've been a very, very fortunate person and I just think it's important that we give back. And I think education and youth are the key for everything we do. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, I'll be in touch. question yeah. so I had a question Jim about the overheads so um, I know the they are volunteers but still you know do they spend their money and go or do does the shelter box take care of their travel needs our response team members you mean mm -hmm. um, the team lead will be carrying a shelter box credit card uh, no everything in the field I'm not saying they never have to pull out and cover something but it would be reimbursed um, but no, we take care of our teams. Your airfare is covered, all that's covered. Um, uh, again, the team leads, uh, we, we send teams out. It will never be less than four people. And there's always gonna be a team lead. And then usually those teams will split up. Two people will be responsible for working the gear through customs. Two people are looking for where it's, it's uh, delivered. Uh, now you get into something like Haiti and we were sending out teams of 15 or 20 people. 